Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and to kick things off, I want to talk to you about two exciting virtual events we have coming up. The first is our virtual hunt series happening March 30th through April 1st, where we'll be giving away $7,500 in prizes and hosting live virtual Q&A sessions with some of the best in the business on turkey hunting, land management, and trap shooting. Register for that one at shields.com forward slash hunt series. The next is our virtual fishing series we have happening April 13th through the 15th. This is again a free online Q&A format where we're going to have nights on bass fishing, fly fishing, and walleye information along with giving away over $4,500 in fishing gear. Register for that one online at shields.com forward slash fish series. Registration is free and that's the only way you become eligible for those awesome prize packages. Today we're going to be talking about open water fishing. Here in North Dakota, the ice is coming off and areas with moving water are opening up. And as you head further south, the season is here. In studio today, we're joined by Shields fishing expert, Jaden Thomas, who is our very first Shields Outdoors podcast guest talking night fishing and rip jigging tactics. That's a two part segment. And if you haven't listened to those, make sure to go back and check them out as Jaden provides tons of awesome information on those topics. Jaden, it's great to have you back. Hey, it's great to be back. I was honored to be one of the first people on the podcast, and it's even more of an honor that you guys had me back. I guess I must have done something right. Yeah, yeah, you offered a, you offered a lot of great information. So, um, you know, this, this one we're going to be talking about, open water fishing, but uh, first I'd like to dive a little bit into, into how your ice season went. So how did that go for you? I had a great year. I probably had my best year for catching big panfish that I've ever had. Um, I caught more big crappies over 14 inches in one season than I ever have before. Um, tons of big bluegills too. Got a couple right around that 10 mark or just a little bit over it. Um, and that was my uh, that was my plan going into this ice season. I made a concerted effort. I said, I want to catch big panfish. Uh, not that I struggled to do that in the past. I'd say I just struggled to do that consistently. Um, I guess I'd kind of worn my welcome out on a lot of lakes. I'd fished since I was a kid. I just living in Fargo here and being pretty close to the Detroit Lakes area and then Ardertail County. They have some of the best panfish lakes and big panfish lakes um, in the Midwest here. So I knew with that being in my backyard, the opportunity was there, and I just had to put the work in to make it happen. And I think I did that. I had a great year, explored a ton of different lakes, uh, got my butt kicked a couple times, but I took it to the fish myself a few times too. So all in all, it was a great year. Yeah, there you go. That's why they call it fishing and not catching. Amen. <laughs> All right. So, um, so what are the similarities and differences between, uh, your strategy on ice fishing versus, uh, versus your ice off fishing? So when it comes to late ice, like we're dealing with right now in the last few weeks, um, it's kind of a preview for where the fish are going to set up, uh, once ice out, uh, comes. And right now we're going through that in North Dakota here. A lot of the rivers are opening up. That's where a lot of your first opportunities for fishing can happen, uh, specifically uh, walleye. Um, Minnesota, walleye season is closed. But North Dakota, walleye season is open all year long. And North Dakota has a lot more, I'd say, spring opportunities for walleye than even Minnesota would have. Uh, I know Minnesota has a great spring bite for walleyes on the Rainy River. But in get more than Dakotas here, you have the Missouri River. Um, go, runs all the way from North Dakota down to South Dakota. You have the Cheyenne River, the Red River. Um, a ton of other smaller tributaries of those rivers too that have great fishing opportunity but uh, what i look for when it comes to late ice i look for where are those fish staging uh, walleyes typically are going to spawn usually a couple weeks to a month after ice out the te- keep temperature you're looking for for walleye spawn is about f- that 40 oh, i think it's 44 46 degrees if i remember correctly um so i know when i'm uh, usually around late ice that water is right around mid upper 30s right as the ice is going out so those fish are going to be typically off that first break of where they're going to spawn and where they're going to spawn is shallow current areas windswept shorelines places with hard bottom typically two to five feet of water and if you can find that first break line or let's say you're fishing a river, uh, river for example if you can find where that channel drops into the main channel or that break line drops into the main channel deep water 
that's where those fish are going to be held up right before right before ice out. So if you can find those, you're going to be able to find where those fish are at a couple weeks later. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, do you are you a big fan of targeting walleye uh, early, or are you you doing a lot of panfish? Kind of a mix of both. No, I'm I'm big on walleye come spring. Uh, I'm a walleye fisherman through and through. Um, I do can still consider myself a multi-species guy. I think that's important. You have to understand a multitude of species to really understand one. What I mean by that is every fish in an ecosystem plays off each other at some point, whether it's uh, talking about spawning habitat, um, what they're feeding on, everything is connected in an ecosystem. So to only understand one part of that, you're really pigeonholing yourself when you start to understand every part of it and how it all works together. Uh, everything opens up and things become a lot easier for you. But with that being said, most open water season, I'm focused on walleyes. Uh, but when it shifts to the hard water, I focus on panfish. But now that we're switching back to open water again, things are thawing out. I'm really dead set on walleye. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay, let's talk about, uh, you know, gear and preparation mm -hmm. for, uh, for this upcoming season. Um, what have you been doing to prepare yourself for open water? So I kind of do the same. I have my own process I do every single year, and it actually starts at the end of the season, uh, year before. So when you come in the ice up, uh, once open water season is done, um, biggest mistake I see people do is that, and it's easy to do. I I used to do it all the time. Um, I'm guilty of it. Nobody's perfect, but uh, it's a lot of people just tend to throw their fishing stuff, you know, corner of the garage, throw it in the shack, throw it in the shed, put it up in the rafters, and just forget about it and think it'll be good till next season. That's not what you want to do, especially with uh, rods and reels and line. So uh, biggest thing come the new season is making sure your reels are good to go, your lines good to go, and your rods. What I do by that is at the end of every season, I oil, lube, and dust off all my reels. You just take care of them. It, trust me, if you just do that, take an hour uh, once a night each fall, just do that to all your reels. A couple dabs of oil, any oscillating part, any a little bit of grease on anywhere there's uh, gears or screws, and then just take a microfiber cloth and just wipe them all down. Trust me, it will make your reels last longer than ever before. I've got reels that are almost 10 years old now that are just as good as the day I got them because I started doing this about six years ago when I started investing in a lot more higher end gear. It just adds years to your gear. The next thing I do is then I strip all the old line off my reels. If it's mono, fluoro, or a really beat up uh, lead core, I strip all that off. I'm going to put new stuff on then the year before, the next year. Mono and fluoro you want to change every year. Fluoro I actually probably change two or three times a year because it's so stiff on spinning reels. It'll hold a lot of memory. Um, so it's, it's going to deteriorate really fast. Same with mono. Mono uh, absorbs a lot of uh, UV rays from the sun. So even just leaving your rods, let's say you go fishing every day in the summer, it, maybe you have a rod, split up a six-pound mono used for crappies, right? April through May. Then June through August, you don't really use it. Well, even if that rod just lays on your boat deck, or let's say it stays in your garage and gets really hot in the summer, the heat and UV rays affect monofilament like no other. It will weaken it, damage it. So even though you may have not used that line, you know, air quotes used it for a couple months. By the end of that season, it's it's garbage. It's bad line. It's going to break really easily. It's going to have a lot of memory. So you got to change that every season. Uh, with braid, braid is very tough, very abrasion resistant, very durable. Uh, it doesn't absorb those UV rays like mono, monofilament does. So braid is the one line you can get away with using for years on end. Really, the only sign that you need to change your braid is if it's visibly worn. You know, just hold it up to the light, see if it's frayed. If it's not, I mean, you're still good to go. I've used spools of braid for three, four years before I needed to change it. Really, my sign needed to change braid is when I start casting and I'm, I can see my backing. That just means I'm running out of line then. So mm -hmm. that's when I'll change braid. Yeah, makes sense. So, um, you know, how, how many different types of uh, rod reel combos do you recommend having? Well, if you're asking me, I have, <laughs> I have more than anyone can ever need, and I still buy yeah. more. I mean, Recom I, recommend yeah. 100 to 200, but, um, right? <laughs> uh, if we're stocking specifically spring fishing, and if we're talking walleyes, um, a lot of that is going to be jigging. Um, shore fishing, fishing shallow in the boat. Uh, you're fishing relatively shallow water, and it means relative depending on where you fish. But for a lot of spring walleye fishing, mean, I'd say a majority of it's done less than 15 feet of water, probably even less than 10. And jigging is a great way to cover that. Uh, jigs and plastics, jigs and live bait. Um, so a good all-around jigging rod, I'd say anything around six, six to seven feet long. Um, 
medium light if I'm doing live bait or lighter jigs, like an eighth ounce, sixteenth, uh, a quarter, like the heaviest. Um, if I'm doing more artificials, maybe moving baits a bit faster, fishing more current, uh, maybe just targeting bigger fish on average. I like a uh, medium or maybe even medium heavy if you're going after really big fish or using really big baits. Um, the main uh, key though that you want to have regardless of power length of your rod is the action. I always like an extra fast anytime I'm jigging just because an extra fast action has a really quick tip. So that means the less action you have to do to make that bait move. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So if you have, let's say, a moderate action or even a fast action, it's a slower action rod. So you're going to have to move that rod more to make that bait move more. So with an extra fast, uh, it's le- less taxing on you after a long day. It's less you have to do, and you get a lot better control of your bait, especially when it comes to artificials. Control over your bait is everything. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to have that extra fast, especially when you're doing your jigging and stuff. Are, are there certain situations where you don't want an extra fast? The only real jigging situation I don't use an extra fast is if I'm like really slowly dragging live bait, like a jigging a shiner, jigging a fathead, jigging a leech, jigging maybe half a crawler. And that's where I'm just slowly either with my boat, just pulling that jig slowly along the shallows, or let's say I'm pitching out, I'm just slowly dragging across the bottom. I like that fast in that situation, just where if I get a bite, you know, typically in those situations, lighter bite. We've all dealt with walleyes that can be finicky. I think just barely pick that jig up, like even the big ones. Um, that fast action just gives you a little bit more cushion to kind of pull back and kind of feel if they're there or not, or maybe just let them suck on and inhale a little bit more if they need to. But other than that, I'm pretty much always extra fast. That's maybe the only situation where I have one or two fast jigging rods. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So early season, what are, you, what are your favorite styles of fishing for walleye? I uh, love pitching jigs. Um, I like pitching crankbaits too. Uh, that's kind of underrated. Um, when I was a kid growing up and when I was learning walleye fishing, kind of the rule of thumb was uh, once you get below 50 degrees, uh, crankbaits, they don't work. Uh, it's too cold. The fish aren't going to want to chase. Um, they're not that aggressive. They don't want to eat that much. That's, that's a lie. Um, I think where people think crankbaits, they think fishing fast, think fast, aggressive, you know, trolling, two miles an hour casting, uh, burning them back as fast as you can, uh, ripping them back, uh, jerking them as hard as you can. Yes, that works when the water temperature is hot. When that water gets into that 55 plus, you know, starts getting warm, then warmer, then it's hot. But when that water is cold, those fish, yes, they still need to eat. They still have metabolism. They're still going to chase down baits. They're just not going to do it very fast. So you need to adjust accordingly. So I'll, I'll throw a crank, instead of throwing maybe a number seven flicker shad, you know, pretty standard size bait, pretty fast, aggressive action. I'll throw a number seven of Rapala original floater. That's going to be a bait that's not going to go as deep. It's going to have a really tight, instead of a hard knock side to side, it's going to have a really tight wobble or kind of roll over on itself. Um, something that's a lot less aggressive and I can work a lot slower. You'd be amazed how many big fish uh, get taken on crankbaits every spring, uh, whether you're, tr- and that's trolling and casting. And you can do that on a river. This is a thing that works on rivers, lakes. I mean, guys doing it on Creed Bay right now. The North, new North Dakota state record was just caught trolling crankbaits out of the Missouri River a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone's jigging, but those guys are trolling, catching big fish. Kind of my, my general saying, I don't think I can take claim for it. I'm sure I heard it somewhere, but if you want to, it's, <laughs> I think it goes, if you want to fill the live well, bring your jigs. If you want to fill the wall, bring your crankbaits. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, from our from our previous podcast, mm-hmm. uh, I know you're you're a big rip jigging guy. Mm-hmm. So, do you use that tactic at all early season? Not really. There's only been a couple situations where I have, and we're talking like uh, ripping jigging wrap, shiver minnows, those glide baits, those uh, ripping baits. I don't use those a ton early season. And when we're talking early season, we're talking that pre-spawn, spawn, spawn, post-spawn period, kind of that time when that water temperature is from anywhere from 39 degrees to about 50. We're talking that cold water period. Um, Most of that is going to be me throwing jigs and plastics, like a paddle tail, like a a power bait ripple shad. Um, Another good one is a walleye assassin. That's a staple. Another one of my favorites, um, bee fish and authentics moxie with a ring tail on it. Stuff that... that has action, but it's still fairly subtle. Like I said, that water's still pretty cold. So you don't need something that's gonna, that's gonna have a crazy knock to it, crazy hard vibration to it. You want something that's gonna get those fish's attention, but isn't gonna 
blow them away. You know, said the water's still very cold. These fish aren't super charged up. They're not going to run stuff down. They're looking to attack and kill. They're just looking to feed up and stock up right before that spawn and then right after that spawn. Okay, makes sense. All right, so um, you uh, you just got yourself a new boat, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my family got a new one. There you go. Uh, what what were, did you have to do to to get that ready for the season? Is there is there new things you're buying? On yeah, there? I got a couple new electronics. I'm a Lowrance man myself, personally. Um, and I'm I'm not sponsored by Lowrance. I'm I believe everything's good these days. Garmin, Hummerbird, Lowrance. Uh, I'm not going to get in any <laughs> electronics wars with anybody. I prefer Lowrance. Um, I'm most comfortable with it. I ran it for years. I believe their technology is the best. Um, all their imaging, I can read it really well. So I added a couple new Lowrances this year. Um, I don't think I can do it this year. Year, but I think next year, then we're going to add that. Lawrence came out the new Active Target, kind of their answer to the Garmin Live Scope. Mm-hmm. I've gotten to see a uh, few images of that. Few of my uh, one of my buddies actually has it and got to see it in person. It's pretty impressive. I'm I'm pretty impressed with it. Very cool. So, um, you know what? What exactly are you are you doing to your boat to to get it prepared? Like, what did you do for storage, and then what are you looking at now to make sure things are fully functional, ready to go. Yep. So everything I do once we pull the boat out of storage, um, one thing we're good about too, every time we put the boat away, even the boats we had before this one, um, our last times out in the fall, we're always running fuel stabilizer through there. That's the number one thing you got to do. Uh, uh, stable, just buy some. It's not, it's not expensive. If you're fishing, we usually start doing even around September. Um, we like to keep our boat out to usually the end of October, but even around September, you never know around here when that's, th- you know, that freeze up's going to come. It's come, come as early as er, early October. It's come as late as, you know, December. But uh, the end of the season, you want to make sure you're running some kind of fuel stabilizer through your through your outboard engine. That's going to uh, prevent any seize ups, anything gumming up, getting any um, just bad, just bad gunk in any of your lines, your injectors. It's going to make sure everything's clean running to go next season when you pull it out. Um, other things we do when every time I pull the boat out, uh, just make sure all electronics are good to go. You, uh, you, I can't stress this enough. When you pull your boat out of storage, make time to put it in the water somewhere before your first fishing trip. What I mean by that is let's say you pull your boat out and you know you're going to the rainy, rainy river for walleyes in three weeks. Don't let your first time turning on the ignition or it's turning on the electronics B when you dump your boat and at the landing at the rainy river. You, you don't want that to happen because something goes wrong. It's a big inconvenience to you. It's a big inconvenience to other people at the ramp. Um, you just, and it's going to ruin your day. I mean, that's not how you want to start your seasons by getting, going out on your first trip and realizing you have all these problems. So I just tell guys, take an, if you're close to a body of water, take an afternoon after work, take a day on the weekend, just get out there and make sure everything's running accordingly. I always like to make sure and get out there, um, Put the boat in first, make sure the engine works, make sure everything's running right. Then make sure your trolling motor's all good to go. Make sure your batteries still hold their charge. Um, make sure electronics, everything's good. Um, make sure they're wired correctly. Uh, and there's no shortages. Make sure the fuses are still good. There's just a lot of th- little things you can do before your season really ramps up that can save you headaches in the long run. That way, if you do notice any of these problems, you can get them fixed right away. And the best part about finding problems right away too Usually, I mean, we're going to run into it again this year. Last year, I'm sure everyone saw it. It came around June. Store shelves were empty. You don't want to run and have problems and not be able to get a replacement or get a fix when you need to later in the season than when you can early in the season. Also, too, if it's something you can't do under your own power, you need to get it into a shop, you know, in Marine Tech, they're usually a lot less busy February, March, April than they are May, June, July. So taking all those steps are going to ensure you're going to have a successful season or at least a start to a successful season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure every hardcore fisherman has experienced that. You get super excited about the season. You get your boat out the first time and then, you know, turn that ignition and it's not going. (laughs) Yeah, it it might be nothing that you could control. You know, maybe a mouse got in and chewed your starting wire. That's not, you, you know, you have no control over that. You don't know what happens while your boat's sitting in storage, you know, for four or five months. But it's, it's on you to make sure you find those problems before you get out and get, get into the meat of your season. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Little stuff like that goes a long way. Yep, absolutely. So, um, you know, you, you got me pretty curious about, uh, about this boat you have. And, you know, obviously you do quite a bit of fishing. Um, how do you have your electronics and trolling motor set up catered to, like, exactly the way that you want to fish. Mm-hmm. So um, I'll be first to admit, 
uh, this boat's a little bougie. We got, <laughs> we got a lot of nice stuff on. It's a really nice boat. Um, Nitro ZV21 um, said we run all the rants. I have a HDS-12 at the council. I have another HDS-12 up on the uh, up on the bow. I just I just today I bought another HDS-9 that's going to go on the ba- on the bow with me. So I'll have a 12 inch and a nine on my bow. And I like running that setup. I usually run the 12 inch. That's usually full screen side imaging or side imaging down imaging. It's it's my imaging screen in general. I like having the big screen for that because side imaging, you're able to see so much and cover so much. I want to be able to see as much as possible with the clearest definition, the most space. I don't want anything to be congested and kind of bunched up. I want to get the best picture possible. The nine inch, I usually run uh, like a a split screen of 80% GPS, a most GPS, mainly GPS screen. And there's a little, a little slot of 2D sonar, mainly because I'm only really using 2D sonar when I'm cruising at high speeds. And I don't need to, I'm, yes, I'm using that to mark fish, but more so just to uh, map my depth. I've gotten to the point now, I've done a lot of high speed uh, graphing. It's something I learned about six, five, six years ago. I went to a seminar where Corey Springle was talking about it. And I've used that to my advantage a lot. It's where you're able to mark fish at, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour instead of having to slow down and putter through spots. It takes some time to learn, but if you can learn, it's a, a it's a technique that can be a big advantage to you over your competitors. Okay, that's something that I haven't done so far, so I'm I'm genuinely curious on that. And can you give us just a little a little crash course on yes, that? Yes, yeah. So all it is is just you're just learning to read your uh, sonar screen at, at different speeds. So I think most people are used to you know seeing what fish look like when you're just trotting along, you know, going at fishing speeds, I call it, right? Less than five miles an hour, where you're just cruising down looking for fish or, you know, less than two miles an hour, you're actual fishing, you know, maybe trolling crankbaits or less than a mile an hour, you're dragging a Lindy rig, right? Everyone, most people, most fishermen are going to know what a fish looks like at those speeds. It's going to be a nice defined arc, have some good depth in it, um, have a clear, definite beginning and end, right? When you're marking fish at you know, 20 miles an hour, it's, it's not going to be that very fine, that very long, thick arc. Um, cause how a fish marks 2d sonar, right? The arc starts by when you run over the head of the fish, keeps going, goes over the back and then you hit the tail and that's the end of the arc, right? Well, when you're going 20 miles an hour, that fish is in that cone for very long. So you're not going to get a big arc, usually just a little blip. And I said, this takes, a, it takes time to learn. It's something you just got to go, go and do. Um, it doesn't always work. It works best when fish are kind of in more deeper open water that you're not, one, you're not going to spook them by driving right over them. Two, um, there's a good, there's a good, there's a good, uh, it's deep enough that your sonar cone can cover a decent, a decent area, you know. Typically your sonar cone covers about two, th- about a third of your, what your depth is. So, I mean, you're not going to mark a whole lot of walleyes going 12 miles an hour through seven feet of water, only seeing like a foot and a half. Plus, you're probably going to spook them. Whereas if you're going 20 miles an hour over a 30 foot basin, you know, you're seeing about 10 feet of zone and those fish are 30 feet down. They're not going to be too bothered by your boat. So you have a good chance of seeing them. But what's nice about that is just the, the benefits, the high speed marking is you can cover so much water so fast. That's that's the name of the game in everything fishing. All these different types of images we have, all these tools, electronics, it's all about finding fish as quickly and efficient as possible. So you can get, spend more time with your line in the water because you can't catch them. One, if they're not there, you can't catch them. If you don't have two, you can't catch them if you don't have a lure in front of their face or some kind of bait. So one, you need to be able to find them as quick as possible. And two, get a bait in front of them as quick as possible. That's the advantage of high speed marking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And then uh, also go continue my electronics. So I said, I got, I have I have a 12 at my dash, 12 on the bow, and then a nine on my dash as well. But I have all three of these units hooked together through Ethernet. The benefit to that, if you're running multiple units, you want to have them hooked together. Just in that if you mark a waypoint on one, it's going to show up on all of them. Um, if, you do, if you do settings, it's going to be the same all throughout. You want everything uniform. Just that way, no matter where you're at in your boat, everything's going to look the same uh, no matter what you're looking at, what screen, what view. It's all going to be the same. You want everything uniform as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was some great information you covered on the boat. So um, let's uh, let's kind of move back into the actual uh, fishing side of things. So when you're out there, what um, what's your favorite types of of structure to look for early season? So early season, everything depends and evol- revolves around the spawn. So we're talking walleyes. Walleyes are going to spawn in pr- uh, pretty distinct areas. They're looking for current 
or some kind of windswept shoreline. Biggest thing is current. One thing I don't think a lot of people know about walleyes, walleyes are not natural to a lot of lakes. A lot of the Minnesota Lake walleyes were introduced like years ago, like, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. And they just, they, they do well in lakes. They adapt very well. But walleyes are originally river fish. Uh, that's where a lot of them are. And if you look at a lot of the best walleye systems, they originate from rivers. You look out west here in the Dakotas, you know, Lace Kakawea, Oahe, you go to Montana, you're talking Fort Peck. They're all reservoirs because the Missouri River got dammed up. You look at Lake of the Woods, Phenom and Rainy Lake, Phenom, phenomenal lake fisheries connected by the Rainy River. You look at a lot of the Great Lakes like Green Bay, you have the Fox River, the Peshtigo, you got um, uh, Lake, Saint Cla- uh, lake Saint Clair and then um, uh, Erie. You have the Detroit River. So rivers, current are a big factor in walleye's lives. They love current. They look for it. They have a natural instinct when the spawn is going to look for areas of current. So that's either going to be, one, a river itself, uh, a feeder river or stream into a lake, or uh, what I call pinch points. If you're a deer hunter, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's, it could be anything where like a culvert, a bridge, or just you have two lakes connected by a little inlet, just where it put, puts you together, gets shallower, and there's natural current flows through there because of that. If you have that and some kind of current or some kind of a windswept shoreline, you know, a natural current, right? If you have that paired with shallow, rocky, gravelly structure, anywhere from about two to five feet, you have perfect walleye habitat. And it's important to find that, look for that, because the big thing is if you find those areas where walleye spawn, typically they come back there every single year. So it's one of those things where you find those spots, you get those waypoints, those waypoints can worth their weight in gold for 10, 20, 10, 20 years, you know, the rest of your life, as long as the water levels are decent. So I'm always looking for current or windswept shorelines first. Next, I'm looking to make sure it has rock. Next, I want to make sure it's the right depth. Typically, you don't, walleyes don't spawn very deep. You're talking about two to five feet, usually on average. So it's important to find that, then adjacent, uh, uh, deep water adjacent to it. Someplace these walleyes can slide up and spawn, you know, when the current's roaring, the wind's howling, or more commonly, they spawn at night, you know, early morning, early evening, throughout the night. But then they're in the middle of the day when that sun is bright and high, or maybe you don't have as much current, you don't have as strong a wind, they're just gonna, they're not going to spawn, and they're going to slide back off. That's also why temperature is very important this time of year, too, because that water temperature is key. said so you want that water to be around that 44, 46 degrees. Well, the, thing, the problem you have with the walleye spawning so shallow, that shallow water can be very unstable this time of year. You know, spring in the Midwest, it's very unstable. You can go from 40 degrees to 60 degrees back to 30. It could snow. It could rain. You could get 70 degrees the next day. It's all over the board, right? Well, that shallow water takes a beating in the sense that it can fluctuate so much. So let's say you have, you, let's say you're fishing a small, a small channel, right? Where a, a river dumps into a lake. You found it's got nice current. It's about five feet of water and there's rip rap shoreline all up and down. You know, perfect walleye spawning habitat. Next thing you need to pay attention to is that water temperature. You could have five straight days where it's 50 degrees, right? And that water rises up to like that 45 degree mark. You go out there fishing, you see walleyes busting everywhere. You see males bumping females all throughout the shallows. The spawn's roaring. It's going, I mean, and you make a cast out, you're getting a fish every single cast, right? That's, that's perfect. But then the next day it drops back down to 30, right? That water temp, that five feet of water, it's not going to stay 45 degrees. It might drop all the way back down to 40 degrees, you know, five foot temperature swing those fish will stop spawning. They will just, they'll stop and they'll just drift back out to the deep water adjacent to there. And they won't move back up until that water climbs back. That's why it's so typical this time of year. You usually see the evening be better than the morning during the spring bite. Mm -hmm. Because when it gets dark out, right, that water cools back down all throughout the night. It might've been 45 degrees. And let's say the next day it's, it's, uh, 50 degrees, you know, air temperature again, that water was 45 degrees, but throughout the night it cooled back down to like 42 or 41. Well, those fish are then are going to push back out to the deep water because the deep water stable, you know, it's not changing degrees. It might be 42 degrees, but it's going to stay 42 degrees no matter how warm it gets because it's deep, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get a cold snap, those fish are going to push back out deep and wait for that shallow water to warm back to the comfortable temperature again. It may take, you know, just a couple hours from that sunrise to mid afternoon, like I said, if you get a cold front, it might take a couple of days before they move back up there again. So that's why uh, knowing the habitat where these fish are going to be and then knowing how the temperature is going to affect them are so important to the spring uh, the spring run. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So say, say you're a guy that only has the morning fish. How are you going to target them then? Yep, so typically you got, um, you're going you're gonna to fish slow. 
um, when that water's cold, you got to match their, their energy. You know, they're not looking to eat a whole lot. They're not looking to move around a whole lot. They're not very aggressive in the mornings because it's so cold. That's where I'll usually, let's say the night before, they were up shallow feeding, you know, spawning. I was getting them on a three eighths ounce jig and a four inch paddle tail minnow, right? You know, cranking it pretty aggressively, you know, moving at a decent clip. Well, that next morning now, I may, even it's a lot colder now, those fish aren't as charged up. They haven't had that sun beating on them all day. I'll probably have to scale down. I might go down to like a one eighth ounce jig. um, And then like a three inch uh, plastic, like a curly tail, not something as aggressive or that's gonna thump as loud. Um, You need to match their energy, energy. And it's kind of nice for making yourself go down to a smaller jig size. It makes you fish slower. You cannot fish a three eighths ounce jig, or excuse me, you can't fish a one eighth ounce jig as fast as you fish a three eighths three eighths ounce jig. You just can't. You're not going to stay in bottom contact. That bait's not going to move the same way. So it forces you to fish slower. So that'd be my number one advice. If you can only fish, you know, the down, the morning the morning bite or maybe the slower times of the day, downsize to something that's going to make yourself fish slower. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that kind of makes a decent segue into, uh, into like live bait versus artificial. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you using a lot of artificial baits or do you mix it up? You use a lot of live bait. Um, what's the, what's the situation that you prefer to use one over the other? I mix it up, but I'd say, uh, that morning versus evening is a pretty good, uh, decision maker for me. If you're fishing that morning where you got to fish slower, it usually pays to have, you know, a couple dozen fathead minnows on you for the morning bite, because you're going to have to fish slower and you have to rely more on scent and, you know, taste for that fish to commit than just a reaction strike from a plastic going by their face. Right. Mm -hmm. But as you get into the evening, when the water warms up a couple degrees and those fish are maybe willing to eat a bit more move a bit faster after a bait, that's where then you can maybe just leave the minnow bucket at home and just bring out a box of plastics with you and it'll be just fine. So typically I'd say, depend on, you'd want live bait if you're fishing in the morning or if you're fishing during any kind of a cold front. If you've had stable weather, I'd say uh, fish aggressive, leave the live bait at home, bring out the artificials. That's kind of my best indicator for you. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. So what is it, what does your cadence look like when you're doing live bait versus artificial live bait? It's a lot of really just slow drags, slow lifts, little twitches. I'm letting that, that just that live bait do most of the work. I'm also convincing for me when I'm doing artificials. Now remember we're fishing fairly shallow, so you can't do a giant rip, right? Let's say you're fishing, you're making, you're fishing from shore and you're pitching out in five feet of water. You can't do a three or four foot rip with that bait. One, it's too much. Usually those fish don't want to chase that much. Well, two, if you're fishing in five feet of water, you rip that bait four feet up, it's, you know, that's, that's, you don't have a whole lot of water column to work with, right? That bait's getting way up near the surface and walleyes, I, I haven't done it. I'm not saying you can't. I don't know a lot of walleyes have been caught on top waters, you know, or like surface baits, right? Mm -hmm. You catch them on, you know, sub walks or like suspending baits, but typically if we're working a jig and plastic, you need that bait somewhere near the bottom. So typically in the spring with jigs and plastics, I'm not doing as much, you know, uh, rip jigging or like, uh, pops and rips. I'm do, it's a lot more just either slow, steady retrieves, almost like you're working a crankbait, just straight reeling or just slow pulls. You know, I might pull it instead of pulling it up, I'll pull my rod tip horizontally, like perpendicular or, or parallel to the water line. You get what I'm saying? Do sweeps instead of mm-hmm. rips. So that way you're just pulling that bait. It just comes off the bottom about a foot and go pulls forward about three feet, then just slowly falls back down. Or if I'm just doing that slow reel, I'll just reel it to where I just know my bait's slowly ticking the bottom, might tick off a few rocks, touch a few, tickle a few weeds. That way I know I'm in the strike zone, I'm going at the right speed, and I'm letting those fish chase me down and hit me. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. All right. Now we've, we've started to move a little bit, you know, past the spring and past the spawning season, or, you know, maybe, maybe you're fishing Southern States and it's just, it's warmer than what you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, How does your strategy change as, as the season kind of changes? Yeah. So as the season progresses, if you're talking post spawn, when you were talking that water is about 54, I'd say up to 60, that's where you're talking, you know, end of spring, starting to transition to summer. That's where fish can be anywhere. Um, talking walleye specifically, um, I've got a f- few areas I fish where there can be bites going up in five feet of water. At the same time, there's another bite going out in 
15 feet of water. Same time, guys are smacking a fish out in 29 feet of water. Um, so when the water is some of its most uniform, it's when a lot of bait has come back to life. It's where the ecosystem, like we talked about before, is kind of revamping. Everything's going. Um, there's a lot of options for those fish. There's a lot of places they can go. But the number one thing is after that spawn, you know, those fish might relax, I'd say, for a week or so. But then uh, the, the shift goes back from being reproducing to eating. Um, a fish a fish is wired to do three things. Reproduce, eat, and swim. And it swims so it can eat, and it swims so it can reproduce, and it eats so it can reproduce, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for about two or three weeks out of the year, the only thing on those fish's mind is reproducing the spawn. Every, uh, every other day of the year, it's to eat. So once, once you get past the spawn, that's where you need to transition back to, all right, where's the food? What are they eating? Where are, where are they eating? You figure those things out, you're going to be able to stay on those fish all year long. Mm -hmm. At what point do you start looking into, instead of, you know, current and spawning spots, you start looking at things like weed lines? Yep, uh, as, soon, as soon as they start to come up. Usually a lot of those weeds start to come up once that water hits that 50 to 55 degree mark. Um, one of the first weeds to show up is cabbage. Uh, cabbage is one of my favorite uh, types of cover to fish. I think a lot of fish agree with that. Everything loves cabbage. Big muskies, uh, largemouth, smallmouth, pike, uh, panfish. Cabbage is, just offers a lot of things for fish. It offers cover, uh, places they can hide and ambush. It offers cover for bait fish, so it's going to attract food for them. It's also going to attract, you know, little microinvertebrates, like little tiny bugs, little plankton. Um, then turn, that's going to attract more bait fish, little perch, shiners, everything that's going to eat. So the uh, weed lines after the spawn become one of my favorite things to target because they're one of the first types of cover to show up. Um, and cabbage is one of the first to come up. Next would be coontail. Um, those are the two that I'm mainly always looking for. And I'll follow those weed line patterns all the way till that water hits about 70. Usually once they get, and it's not even so much, I don't leave the weeds in the summer necessarily because the water's too hot. Cause I've, I've caught in, you know, big walleyes, big muskies, big bass in less than five feet of water in the heat of the summer, you know, like 78, 80 degree water. They're there as long as they have room to move. What I mean by that is once the water gets to a certain point, usually around that 70 degree mark, a lot of those nice cabbage coontail beds, they get choked out by kind of trash weed like uh, sand grass, char grass, pond weed, uh, milfoil. You know, weed that's weed that grows really thick and clumpy together. It doesn't leave those fish like good ambush points or good highways from the travel. It forces a lot of stuff out into the deep water. That's where you're, that's where then you start to transition to the little mid to late summer patterns of deep water fishing. Okay, that makes sense. So, what are you? What are your favorite types of lures to use when you transition to that uh, to that weed areas? Um, still, probably jig. I'm I'm a big jig fisherman. Um, I've talked about it uh, with other people before. Uh, jigging is such an intimate way to fish because it, it forces you to pay attention to what's going on. You need to f know when your jig hits the bottom, so you need to know how deep it is. They need to know, you know, what is your jig hitting? You can tell. A good jigger fisherman can tell if they're fishing rocks, sand, mud, weeds, just by the feel of their jig, right? And it's cool. You can start to feel transitions too. You know, let's say you make a cast out, you know, you cast out about 20 yards and your jig falls, boom, you hit something solid. You're like, okay, there's a rock. And you start working it back. About halfway back goes from being a tick, 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 tick to a little, poof, poof. all right, you just went from rocks to probably some sand. Now you hit mud. So you just found some transition lines. Transition lines are highways for fish of all species. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, once again, that's where a lot of food's gonna be, microinvertebrates, uh, crayfish, perch, shiners, all the bait that these fish are eating are gonna run along transition lines. So that's why I like jig fishing. You can get a really good feel for what's going on. And you can be really specific too. Um, this time, usually that time year that uh, after the spawn to before midsummer, fish are still grouped up in pretty uh, good amounts. You know, they're usually raw, usually crews in groups of, you know, six to 10 uh, bigger schools to fish in bigger bodies of water. And I'm talking, you know, other species will travel in groups, you know, crappies will school up, uh, bluegills, bass. So with jigs, then you can really pick uh, fish apart instead of, and I love, you know, pulling live bait rigs, I like pulling cranks. But when you're doing that, you're going through fish. So when you drag us up through fish, you might only be able to pick off one, two, or three before you got to, you know, reel up, reset, and go back through them again. And in that time to do that, they may have moved a little bit. So then you don't hit them that pass. Now you got to make a next pass, try and go over them. Whereas with jigging, you can set up adjacent to the fish or right on top of them, and you can just keep picking them apart. You can throw back to the same spot where you know those fish are coming from every time until literally, like, you you know you probably beat up the school to a pulp, so there's nothing left. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, very cool. So if, uh, if you're not tying on a jig, mm-hmm. what's, what's your next choice? You know, uh, and I, as much as I love artificials, I've really, I've really played around with this a lot the last year. It is so hard in sp- spring and summer to beat a slip bobber. Um, when I was still working at a store, I think it was about four years ago, I really saw uh, slip bobbers make a comeback. And it started on the tournament scene. A lot of my local buddies who were doing tournaments, they started just blowing everyone out of the water um, <laughs> with slip bobbers and leeches. And, you know, they're bringing these giant bags of water. They're telling me, oh, dude, you should have seen the crappies we were catching today, too. We were 14, 15 inch crappies. Oh, you should have seen the smallmouth we were catching, dude. Like, five, six pound smallmouths, like, geez, what are you not catching on these slip bobbers? <laughs> like, well, I would say musky, but when we threw out a sucker minnow on a bobber, we caught a 40 inch musky too. <laughs> it's like, geez. <laughs> so it's, it's really hard to be a slip bobber. And, um, my favorite thing to put a blow slip bobber is leech. Um, you mm-hmm. get a nice large or jumbo leech, you know, three to five inches. Oh, so in, it's so hard for a fish of any species to ignore a nice, lively, juicy leech wriggling swimming in front of their face for more than a few minutes even on the worst condition days i've gone out where you know 70 degrees one day then 50 the next day you know heavy north winds uh cold fronts come cold rain just uh, days you're not supposed to catch fish you know you know just pulling up the access you know uh, it's probably gonna be a tougher day i've had some phenomenal days by just putting everything else away and just throwing some bobbers out and just letting bait do the work um you, you'd be surprised how many fish, too. I've seen it where I've gone through with jigs, you know, fishing aggressive, and I've caught one or two. But then you stop on where you caught those one or two with the jigs, and you throw some, let some bobbers go out. All of a sudden, you pull another 10. So, I mean, you go, it's crazy to see how you go through there fishing aggressive, and you get the aggressive fish, but you don't know how many more fish are there. Just maybe you're neutral or a bit more negative and need a bit more coaxing. And that's the benefit of a slip bobber. You can literally wait those fish out. And like I said, it's, it's so hard for those fish to, them, even if they're not hungry and they're not in a feeding mood, they're going to only ignore an easy meal like that for so long. They're at least going to come up and take a taste of it and give you a chance. Yep, absolutely. And that's uh, that's the beauty of fishing in a state like North Dakota where you can have two lines. It's exactly. Like you you know, you run your jig and set up your active one, and then you just toss your slip bobber out there, and you're just... That's, that's a lethal I, combination. I, I, I right wish there. so bad that Minnesota... I wish Minnesota offered an option where you could... I would pay an extra $50 on top of my out-of-state license fee to have an extra line in Minnesota. I wish they would do something like that. Because if you could have two lines in Minnesota, it'd be, it'd be over. <laughs> it would be over. It'd be, it would be awesome for so many situations. Like when we troll cranks on uh, Lake of the Woods, you know, it's a great crankbait lake. It fishes a lot more like a Western Reservoir. But in mm-hmm. North Dakota, Western Reservoir is like, oh, troll with a buddy. I can have four lines. Whereas on Lake of the Woods, you know, now we can each only have one. So instead of running the four line spread, you're running the two. It's like, well, it could be so much more effective if it had more lines. Yeah, <laughs> but exactly. It is but what then, it is. I don't you know, make the rules. Mm-hmm, for sure. And I just then, follow them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, then you might have to run into different things like, you know, different uh, different quantities that you can keep and stuff yep. like that. So. All right. Well, you've uh, you've got me pretty excited to uh, to pull out the long rod. So um, I want I want to hear your favorite uh, early fishing season story. You got one for us? Oh yeah. Um, this was it was actually pretty recent too. It was two years ago. Um, I went up to Devil's Lake. Uh, and Devil's Lake, uh, for those of you who don't know, if you don't have a boat and you can only shore fish. Devil's Lake should be a place you visit a couple times a year. It's it, n- that's not up for debate. I would say Devil's Lake is the best. Is I shouldn't say the best because I haven't fished everywhere. It is without a doubt one of the best places to consistently catch numbers and quality of walleye from shore. I mean, there's days shore fishermen will outfish boat fishermen. It's almost, it's almost a burden to have a boat on Devil's Lake sometimes, especially early season, because there's so much flood water. Devil's Lake constantly rot, goes up and down. And depending on the water level, a lot of back tributaries, back creeks, old sloughs get flooded. And as soon as that happens, those fish, they love it. They push back in and that's where they're going to do a lot of their spawning. Mm-hmm. So there's old flooded road beds, old culverts, old bridges where these fish do these spawning. And it's easy. It's semi-easy access some spots are easier to get to than others i like the ones off the beaten path just because usually less people and usually those fish i've never seen lures but uh getting off topic what what i what getting back to my story was uh two years ago we went up to devil's lake in the spring devil's lake is notorious for having one of the best spring runs uh, in the midwest and 
we checked out a couple, you know, common spots. You know, uh, we drove by Channel A, usual 50 trucks and 100 people were there. I was like, all right, definitely not going to stop there. We checked a couple spots north of Channel Lake, the North Feeder Lakes, uh, Alice, Irvin, Mike's. Now, you can't fish Alice, open water, but you can fish the North Tributary. You just can't fish the lake itself. So I just want to make that clear for one out there. Jaden didn't tell you to go fish Alice in the spring because it was legal. It's not. I, I do not put that on me. Um, but we checked out, and it wasn't great. You know, we were catching a few walleyes, but not like what it should be. You know, good a good day in Devils in the spring, uh, two or three guys, you can put 50 to 80 walleyes in, you know, in the net. You you can have – I've had some ridiculous days, and this day was one of them. Uh, we just uh, – so I pulled up Google Earth, and I just started looking, you know, where's some back-flooded areas – they're a bit off the beaten path. You know, I had my waders with me, I had my boots. You know, I was with my uncle and cousin. We had the gear, you know, to get away from the masses, right? And we did it. I found, we found a little back eddy. There was an old, old creek that ran out of devils and had a bridge through it, right? So we went over there and right away we pulled up to the little bridge. And this bridge is only maybe like 30 feet long, you know, 12 feet across. Um, there was some strong current pushing through there. And I was seeing fish boil out in the distance. I thought at first they were pike. Just so I was like, ah, oh, you know, pike are jumping the pike. You have just finished spawn and they're probably cruising around these shallows, whatever, right? We started pitching jigs and I think it was my cousin, I think it was his third cast, pulled up like a 20 inch walleye. I was like, oh, okay, sweet. Threw that on the stringer, you know, good eater. It's a male, it's milking. Then uh, the next five hours, I think we caught somewhere between 50, 60 walleyes. Oh. It was, it, it, it was not, it was ridiculous. And it, we, we started hitting them at about noon, but once it hit about five o'clock that evening deal I told you about, those last two hours, it was every other cast. It wasn't, it wasn't a matter of if you're going to get bit. It was a matter of when. Am I going to get bit? Is my lure going to make to the bottom, or am I going to actually have to reel it in halfway before I get smoked? It was, it was ridiculous. And it was all from shore. Um, I had my waders on. I was standing in you know, a foot of water all day. It was great. Um, and we caught a ton of eaters. We put back a few trophies too, you know, some pre-spawn females, uh, and it worked out. I had the next two days off. I ran right back up the devils and I fished that same spot. And I think in three days, we, I think, I, I think we pulled 200 walleyes out of there. We didn't keep 200 walleyes. No, yeah, yeah, I'm obviously. not saying that, but yeah, it was, it was, it was stupid. And they were, they were all such quality. I mean, the, the males were all like sick cookie cutter, 16, 20 inches, a couple 21, 22 in there. But then every now and then you get up fat 26 27 inch female just loaded with eggs and you knew when he set the hook it was just a it was you, you knew when you knew when you felt that hard thunk that that big pre-spawn female wall just inhaled your jig and when you laid the wood into them your drag starts you're like yep this is this is why we came so yeah that that's one of my best memories i got a lot of memories like that from up up near devils so once again I'm not being paid by Devil's Lake Chamber of Commerce all, but I'm telling y'all, if you shore fish, you need to get to Devil's Lake in the spring. You just have to. Yeah, and that's something that I haven't done yet. You know, it, it sounds like a whole lot of fun. I mean, catch 200 fish. Like, who do, who doesn't want to do that? It is. And like I say, it's, it's, it's what, I, what I love about shore fishing is it's so minimalistic and kind of brings you back to your roots. You know, I think we all have some kind of story where we started fishing, you know, our grandpas or dads or moms, whoever got you out fishing, you probably start, you probably have some of your earliest memories fishing from a bank or a bridge or, you know, you didn't always, not all of us started out with fishing in a big fancy boat or even a boat period, you know. My earliest memories are fishing a little creek for bluegills with my grandpa when I was two years old, you know. And I continue doing my earliest memories walleye fishing are fishing Devil's Lake in July off the rocks with my grandpa when I was eight years old. I didn't fish Devil's Lake from a boat for my first two years fishing there. I fished all from shore when it was first coming up. And we did we did great. We did just as good as the guys with boats, you know? So that that's what I love about shore fish, especially in the spring. It kind of, it really, it's like ice fishing weight evens the playing field for a lot of guys. The fish are so accessible to everyone, not just everyone who has the money to get mm -hmm. a boat or a big fancy boat, you know? Yeah, we're just, we're kind of coming up to the time where you just, you need to get a rod, you need to get out there mm -hmm. and you don't need a boat. You don't need to have a whole bunch of money to do it. Literally anyone can do it. Pick yourself up a rod, a few jigs and, and, you know, just get out there. One rod spooled up with eight pound braid, a box of probably a dozen to 20 jigs because fishing rocks, you will lose jigs. It's, I don't care how good you a jig fisherman are, you will lose jigs. You don't, if unless you're, if you're not catching fish, if you're not fishing where the snags are, I'm just telling, that's a little tip I'll give everyone right now. That's where the, usually the biggest and best fishing is. One rod spooled up with braid, a dozen jigs and a dozen plastics. That's all you need. You will be set. 
Perfect. All right. Well, you know what? Thank you for your time, Jaden. Thank you for all that information. You uh, you definitely got me excited to get out and, and get back fishing. Hey, absolutely. I, I, I once again, I appreciate you guys having me. Big fan of podcast. I think you guys have been doing great. <laughs> it's, it's cool to see how far you guys have come from the first episode. I mean, that no one can see this right now, but when we first started, we were in a little office space when we recorded the first one. Now you got your own studio and everything. It's awesome. I love it. Yep, so yeah, keep doing your thing. It's pretty sweet. Love the progression. Yeah, we just, uh, hey, let's start doing podcasts. <laughs> okay, we got our equipment. Well, well, we don't have anywhere to do it. Let's just find an uh, empty office room and see what happens. And yeah, it's a, it's been a fun ride so far. And it's, yeah, it's great to have you back on and see see where we've come. And, you know, what's even more exciting is where we're going to go. Exactly. Mm -hmm, for sure. Great. Well, uh, you know, best of luck this, uh, this upcoming spring season. Hopefully we can see you on social media, holding some, holding some nice fish up, maybe hear some more stories. Absolutely. I'll do my best. All right. Best of luck out there. Take care. You just heard our conversation with Shields expert Jaden Thomas on open water fishing preparation and tactics. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out in the comments of this podcast or visit one of our stores and talk to any of our Shields experts. They will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have, and our fishing shops are fully set up with anything you need to have a successful open water season. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please give us a follow on the listening platform you chose today. And with that, we want to thank you for listening and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.